brought to you by Brand South Africa. Welcome back to this special Forbes Roundtable discussion. Still with me in studio, John Kachura, Head of Corporate Banking at Barclays Africa, and Rian Kutsia, Head of Agro Industries at the IDC. Well, I said I'd come back to Ethiopia and the Commodity Exchange, and what really struck me when I looked at this model was how the farmers are now benefiting about 70% of the final export price, rather than before the Commodity Exchange, they only received about 40% of the final export price, and it's got everything working in tandem, perhaps a model that we can replicate elsewhere across the continent. Absolutely. So, so I think on, on, on that, the, the government together with the commodity exchange have done a really good job of creating transparency into the, uh, what I call the marketing chain. Right. If you look at quite a number of countries, they have had what they call cooperatives through which farmers market their produce. But what they don't typically have is once the produce leaves the land or leaves the farm, they have no, no idea what the pricing is out there. What the commodity exchange in Ethiopia has done is make that process very transparent. So they can clearly see, right? If you go to buy a maize from a farmer in Ethiopia, they'll tell you, well, we know the price. Okay, you're not coming here to negotiate to low ballers. They can see it, it's on the commodity exchange. And that has been a great model that can be employed across the continent. And I think, you know, there was a lot of interest on that. I know a number of people did a tour of the commodity exchange. A lot of governments are looking into how they can employ that model. Leverage that model countries. across exactly. the other countries. Yeah. You wanted to go back to technology, Leon, and how technology is helping to shape the story. I think one of the biggest skills or requirements for small scale growers is actually to increase their productivity. And it's amazing how cell phone technology can be utilized to actually inform farmers very remotely what to do next and how to deal with specific problems. And this transformational um, technology use is amazing to see the outputs, how small scale farmers actually doubled their yields by just having access to information and technology can play a big role there. What about land reform? Now we know this is a hot topic and here we have to be cognizant of the fact that we've had land grab issues. That doesn't go well with the foreign investment community and it could see perhaps money flowing away from agriculture when it should be deployed in that space. What are your thoughts on, on land reform across Look, the country? I, I, think, I think land policy is key um, for development of agriculture. No one wants to make long-term investment on a piece of land that they don't know they're going to own in two years' time. Uh, so there is, sincerely, a drive. If I look at a country like Kenya, they went ahead and in their constitution now, they have put land reform as a key driver for growth. Right. In the Vision 2030, one of the ones cited is, again, land reform. And how do you make sure that people feel ownership? Because ownership is key. Nobody's going to invest on something that they do not own. However, I think the other thing that was important coming from the World Economic Forum is people said, it's not so much about democracy and governance. It's about predictability. So even if we go through land reform, what people are asking for, let it be predictable. I mean, you know, you cited the land grabbing. That's not predictable. So it has to be done in a predict, predict, predictable manner for people to feel comfortable making it. Where is the example of land reform that works in an emerging market? Can I just mention one thing first? Um, I think land is very important. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient for transformation or to package an agricultural project. And what you'll find is that financiers, such as APSA and, 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 and IDC as well, are actually utilizing value chain funding mechanisms where the offtake is used as security. So what has happened that, uh, is, is that in uncertain periods where you're not certain where the land will go, you try and secure um, uh, through the value chain. And new products, very innovative products, is being developed at the moment. Okay, so explain, the, take me a step back, explain for the lay person, you say yeah. you secure against the offtake. So, so put that as a product for me. So, so what you have, you'll have a company who want to procure sugar perhaps for juice manufacturing. They are willing to provide an offtake to a specific uh, small group, um, older grouping. And that offtake is then utilized as security against which funding is provided. And then, of course, the necessary insurance products are actually brought in to, to mitigate the agricultural risk as well as the, um, the technology risk that you might face. So let me come back to my tough question because I'm not going to let you get away <laughs> with it. Where's the example of land reform that works in an emerging market? 
Um, where there's stability, when people know what is the clarity of the process, if they know um, what the process is and if there's consistency and transparency in that process, then it is uh, perceived is by Is there an investors. example that comes to mind? Yes, there are. There are examples, I can again mention Tanzania, um, which actually have played a role specifically around these projects, which they've identified to ensure that that is not at question at all. John, from your perspective? Besides Tanzania, any other examples of successful land reform programs? Well, I, I would cite a place like India, where land was an issue. But I think uh, India has done a very good job of putting in place um, means and ways to own land, uh, minimum ownership, or sorry, maximum piece that you can actually own. And if you go beyond that, what you're required to do with it. That sort of thing that makes sure that people are not just holding land, if you know what I mean. They're using it for productive um, uh, uh, value. Um, I think that has be, been good. I, I think also it's worth saying that uh, most African countries have handled it well. Um, I mean, let's be frank. You know, we, we need to give ourselves enough credit here. I think a number of African countries have handled the whole land reform question quite well. Right today, you hear the debate in Zimbabwe. You're hearing the debate here on our home turf in South Africa. But if you look across Africa, land reform isn't such a big question anymore. But then, of course, the media and the investment community harp on what is negative, And those negative stories get out there and scare foreign investors. Uh, absolutely. And I, and, I, and I think what it is is that land reform may have been done well, right, and land redistribution done. But what it is, the land laws themselves, the property rights laws themselves, need to be cast in stone. So that, to me, is the issue. How do you make sure the property rights are well understood, cast in stone, you can go to a court of law and, and justify why you own this piece of land? It's not redistribution. It's the re actually identifying what the property rights are. Rian, you wanted to add. And quite often it's not about land ownership. It's just access to the land or if you can secure a long-term lease on the land. And that's where a lot of African countries, such as Mozambique, has developed very uh, dynamic uh, lease mechanisms, which is acceptable for investors. And, 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 and it's, it's, so it's not really about who owns the land, but do you have access and is that access secured or not? This issue of regional integration, coming back to it, and pooling resources. Yes. Let's, for instance, say pooling power, yes. which we've seen some mechanisms working towards these lines. Do you think that, obviously, that's going to fast track development in the agricultural space? Power will transform the agricultural landscape. Yeah. Can we see that happening quicker? Absolutely. And it's going to be, it's going to be driven by something, a bit of a catalyst, not necessarily agriculture, and that's infrastructure. We talked about infrastructure. But we talked about the physical and the soft, soft. infrastructure. Those are all cross-border issues for the most part, right? And that is where the pulling together comes through. Okay, if you look at the physical infrastructure, let's start there. Very few countries are big enough or have the, um, the wherewithal to build this massive road project or massive power projects, right? So they have to be done inter-country. A good example would be, um, you know, Ethiopia is developing this huge hydropower project, but they, but they can't use all the power. So they need Kenya to come on board, they need someone else to come on board to purchase some of that power. I'm sure there are lots of people who are borrowing exactly. that power very happily. Uganda recently discovered, oh, they need to get it to the ocean. There's no way to do that. They're landlocked. They need to work with Tanzania, with Kenya, with whoever to get it to the ocean. So, so those are the things that are going to drive this regional integration. And by so driving this regional integration, as we said before, agriculture benefits from good infrastructure. So pool resources, that's a yes. big theme that we've got to focus on going forward. Again, do you think it's happening? John has referred to, to some stories and to some examples in that space. Rian, in your experience? There's definitely an acceleration uh, in the efforts. Um, I think with the whole green economy issue coming to the front and um, countries realizing that they need to uh, cut back on the, the, the pollution and the, the um, carbon harming um, practices, um, and they don't have the solutions themselves, you'll find that the, 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 the countries are starting to work together. Coming back to an earlier point, John, you made about agriculture needing to be a business. What about this food security issue and feeding Africans first, which obviously has to be a priority? Is there going to be room for business beyond feeding Africans? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, the, the investment, what, what we are focusing, what uh, I guess the World Economic Forum focused on quite heavily, is how do we get people to make investments in agriculture? And how you do that is you have to make a business case, right? So the idea that food is just for feeding the locals cannot be a business case. 
business case has to be that the Walmarts of the world need us to provide them with, you know, to fill up their shelves. How do we do that, right? The, uh, the tea drinkers in, I don't know, in Taiwan need tea from Africa. How do we make sure that we, uh, we meet that demand? Once you define the business case, then the investment that we are looking for comes through. So it's very important. And in the process, I must say, Browning, that once you do that, you'll be feeding yourself anyway because nobody's going to export and leave themselves hungry. You wanted to add? Yes, I think what is quite important is that the food crisis has shown us that cheap food is unfortunately not there anymore. So if one talks food security, is not only the supply of food, but also generating income generating opportunities uh, for, for the poor so that they actually have the income to procure food. So um, I think this initiative, the Grow Africa initiative, therefore focus on agriculture as a growth opportunity, but also a, um, uh, for food security, but also for employment creation. Uh, to to afford people to have income to actually afford food. I think the other, the, the other interesting yeah. point that was made was uh, someone did make the observation that quite often in Africa we will grow food, we will uh, import it, and then export fuel. Mm. Instead of saying we're developing the food, why can't we do biofuels bio on, on our backyard? Yeah. Why do we need to be exporting food and importing this expensive fuel? So, 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 so it's not just exporting when I say business. It could be business to support, uh, basically integrate up Absolutely, uh, and diversify the agricultural spectrum. Yeah. spectrum. I think the biggest risk we run is like some mineral industries in Africa where we just utilize as a resource and we do not add value. And therefore, if we're not careful, people will procure land, buy up land, and export uh, unbeneficiated uh, uh, agricultural produce. So that's where we need to get our act together uh, to develop those beneficiation, not only uh, 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 normal tea, but processed tea, um, not only uh, 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 fruit, but also processed fruit, which provide you actually more high uh, value add. And I think, and I think just yeah. to add to that was, was broadening the definition of resources. Yeah. When people say resources in Africa, quite often they mean digging under the topsoil. And I guess what we're saying is agriculture is actually a resource that we have. How do we harness that? Exactly. And what I'm going to finish on is get you both to give your viewpoint in terms of the next five years when it comes to agriculture on the continent. What do you expect the biggest development to be if we jump forward five years and look at what has happened on the African continent from an agricultural perspective? John, can I start with you? Sure. I expect land, land consolidation. In other words, more of the small-scale farmers consolidating to go into commercial farming. I expect more mechanization in the process. Therefore, the likes of, of um, GE, the likes of John Deere, the likes of Caterpillar, We'll have a field day on the, in the, on the continent. And then I expect a really much better policies. There's going to be clear drive towards making sure that one, food security is assured for Africa, but two, foreign investments. China is looking for places to grow food. Qatar is looking for places to grow food. There are all these countries that have the money but not the land, and they're looking to Africa. So in the next five years, what do we expect to see? Actually, that food production becomes a real business for Africa. Really? I see massive expansion of agricultural investment and agricultural activity. Um, quite clear multinationals are moving in, so you'll find that it becomes a globalized business. Where the Walmarts as well as the PepsiCo's, uh, the Unilevers are all here. And um, you'll see that it's quite central to their procurement strategy, not from a corporate social investment point of view, but from a commercial point of view. So agriculture will be pulled into the mainstream uh, of, of global um, commodities uh, or economy. And gentlemen, as I said earlier, I am a farmer's daughter, so this is all very good news in my book. Thank you so much for your time. That brings us to the end of the special Forbes roundtable discussion from me, Bonu Nielsen, and my guests. It's goodbye.